Hello, this is Mrs. Pickens, and I am going to read a few more pages of George versus George, the American Revolution, as seen from both sides. We are going to start today on page 26, which picks up uh, right after the Boston Tea Party. George versus George, 1774 to 1775. The port closure quickly put huge numbers of Bostonians out of work. People were afraid they would starve. Other colonies scrambled to help by sending food, clothing, and flocks of sheep. Americans smuggled at least 5,000 chests of tea from Holland alone. They also smuggled in gunpowder. Bostonians began to think of war. As the siege continued, people from all over the colonies became more and more alarmed. If Boston was in such a sea of trouble, who was to say that things, that worse things couldn't happen in Philadelphia or Williamsburg or Charleston? George Washington didn't approve of the Tea Party one bit, but he approved of the punishment even less. So this is George Washington, and he says, I am ready to raise 1,000 men subsist them myself at my own expense and march at their head to Boston. During September and October of 1774, delegates from all 13 colonies met together in one place for the first time ever at the First Continental Congress in Philadelphia. George Washington was one of the delegates. The Congress sent an appeal for peace and harmony to King George and suggested that Parliament get rid of all the un unconstitutional laws controlling America. Until then, the colonies would not import or buy any British goods and would not export any of their own goods to the mother country. So the mother country was England. In America, British General Thomas Gage was the Commander-in-Chief in America. He said, Affairs here are worse than even at the time of the Stamp Act. If you think 10,000 men are enough, send 20. And then down here in America, Patrick Henry says, Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. That is a really, really famous quote from the American Revolution by Patrick Henry. Over on the England side, Charles Van, a member of British uh, Parliament, said, You will never meet with that proper obedience to the laws of this country until you have destroyed that nest of locusts. So he's talking about the people that were... Uh, raising the rebellion in the colonies. And Samuel Johnson, the greatest English writer, English writer of his day, said, How is it that we hear from the loudest yelps for liberty from the drivers of Negroes? So he is talking about the fact that many of the colonists owned slaves at that time. And here's King George, and he says, the New England governments are in a state of rebellion. Blows must decide whether they are subject to this country or independent. So when he says blows, I believe he means fighting or war. The shot heard round the world. British General Thomas Gage had been trying hard to keep the peace in Massachusetts but he was ordered in the name of the king to use more force. In April 1775, a spy in Boston warned Gage that colonial troublemakers were stashing big piles of ammunition in nearby Concord. This was bad news. A bloody war could break out. Gage decided that the British Army had better go seize John Hancock and Sam Adams, two rebel leaders who were hiding out in Lexington. Then they should burn the weapons in Concord before people started getting themselves killed. Gage quickly planned a secret raid. A British regiment shivered through a chilly night, rowing and then wading across the Charles River. 
On the morning of April 19th, the soldiers had marched as far as Lexington when they came across a 70 Patriot militia gathered on the village green. The rebels were armed because rebel spies William Dawes and Paul Revere had spread the alarm that the British were on their way. So Paul Revere became really famous for that run, but he was actually uh, aided by William Dawes because Paul Revere got captured along the way. Lexington. Everybody's nerves were on edge, still holding their weapons. The Patriots began to back away and look for cover. Then someone fired a shot. Nobody knows who. But as soon as they heard it, the British soldiers started shooting. Eight Americans were killed and ten more were wounded. Not everyone realized it at this time, but the Revolutionary War had just begun. John Hancock and Sam Adams had disappeared. The Redcoats marched onto Concord to destroy the ammunition, but most of the ammunition had vanished too. Meanwhile, great multitudes of men from farms and villages all over the countryside gathered to fight back. And here they are. Some of them are laying on the ground where they were shot, and here are the Redcoats. John Pitcairn, a British major, says, Lay down your arms, you rebels, or you are all dead men. And here is a nice drawing of Concord and all the events that were happening. Up here, the Major Buttrick of the Concord Militia is saying, Fire, fellow soldiers, for God's sake, fire. And down here, Dr. Joseph Warren, a leading Massachusetts statesman says, these fellows say we won't fight. By heavens, I hope I shall die up to my knees in blood. So they were very brave and determined. George Washington was saying, a brother's sword has been sheathed in a brother's breast. The once happy and peaceful plains of America are either to be drenched with blood or inhabited by slaves. And he is talking at that point that they are slaves to the English. There are some red coats marching on Concord. If you look back in the background, you see lots and lots of red coat soldiers. The red coats were for the British. You also see a fire burning in the background. And then you see the colonists hiding in the trees. and across the bridge waiting for the British to arrive. Each side told a different tale about Lexington and Concord. Rebel newspapers reported that bloodthirsty redcoats burned houses, drove naked women into the streets, and butchered old men and infants. The king was told that rebel savages broke the rules of war by ambushing his army. Then they scalped fallen British infantry and cut off their ears. George Washington was already famous for his fearless leadership when he fought alongside the British 20 years earlier. On June 15, 1775, the Second Continental Congress gathered in Philadelphia and unanimously elected the 43-year-old Virginian to become commander-in-chief of their newly formed Continental Army. But how could a small, poorly trained army with almost no money defeat one of the world's most awesome military powers? Washington refused to accept any salary, asking only that Congress pay his expenses. And this is George Washington saying, I do not think myself equal to the command. The very next morning, long before Washington took command of his troops, the Redcoats backed into Massachusetts, awoke to discover an amazing sight. In just one night, about 1,200 rebels had secretly built a massive fort atop Breed Hill by Charlestown. Both sides fought fiercely until the rebels finally ran out of powder and ammunition. The rebels ended up losing the hill, but the British lost 92 officers more than half their men and more than twice as many soldiers as the rebels lost. 
Some say that the rebels' original plan was to occupy Bunker Hill, which was higher and easier to defend. The fight came to be known as the Battle of Bunker Hill. And here are some visuals of the Battle of Bunker Hill. Here we have Charlestown burned by the Redcoats. You see all the Redcoat soldiers in formation. Israel Putnam, a rebel officer, said, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. That's another famous quote from the American Revolution. There's Bunker Hill up in the top corner. William Howe, the British Major General said, from an absurd carelessness or ignorance, we have lost a thousand of our best men and officers. Henry Clinton, a British Major General said, a deer brought victory, another such would have ruined us. So he's saying even though they won the battle, they lost a lot of people. And Thomas Gage, a British general said, these people show a spirit as great as ever people were possessed of, and you must proceed in earnest or give the business up. So when he says these people, he's talking about the colonists, and they had such a great strong spirit to be their own country. So our next section is talking about the British forces and I think this is a good time to stop and take a break. <laughs>